So one of the first things that we want to think about is why do we do urine drug testing? And I'd encourage you as, as, as we're going through the training to type in, if you will, some reasons why you do it or how you do it, and we'll continue to talk about things. And, and every now and then we'll look and, and review some information that we got. So when we think about why do we test, we test for accountability. Uh, as well as to create and maintain a safe treatment environment, and oftentimes with, for compliance with our licensing or policy. And when we think about accountability, we want to think about the idea that uh, as clients are in treatment with us, they need to be accountable to, to us and to themselves for their abstinence. Um, we want to look at creating and maintaining a safe treatment environment if we identify ourselves as a drug-free treatment program, we want to try to create an environment where uh, clients feel safe coming to treatment, where they're not exposed to others who are actively using or bringing drugs on the premises. And we also want to think about compliance with our licensing and our, our own internal policies. So as we think about those things, we need to think about how useful and how valuable our actual testing methods are. So we need to think about collection. And as we think about collection, we need to think about are we supervising or is our collection process unsupervised? And oftentimes programs identify that their, their collection method is supervised, but the person who is giving the specimen is behind a closed door um, or is otherwise not watched. So that um, issue becomes important. When we're looking at working with particularly women, but men as well, who have experienced trauma, we have some issues that might come up with the supervised collection of the specimen, as that can feel like a violation. It can uh, create an unsafe, and we're trying to create a safe treatment environment, but it can, it can create an environment where the individual client feels unsafe in that treatment environment because they feel violated, they feel untrusted, they feel as if they're, they're being victimized in some way that might be similar to what has happened in the past. Something else we want to think about when we're thinking about collection is when do we collect? There are programs that collect every Tuesday and every Friday. Um, there are programs that test um, only when they suspect something. Um, there are programs that truly do random and um, somebody can come into treatment and their name gets drawn, and that's, that's the day that they go in for collection. Um, we have to recognize that, that particularly in outpatient settings, if we're not doing random and we're doing some type of scheduled specimen collection, oftentimes the clients become aware of that. And if they are trying to use while still in treatment, they will modify their use so that oh, I tend to get tested on a Tuesday, so I'll use this day and this day because I know that what I'm using is out of my system by that day. Other issues that we have with collection is staff training. Um, if we are supervising the collection, uh, oftentimes the actual supervision of the specimen collection can be very uncomfortable for our staff. Uh, they can be swayed by the client in not necessarily observing or supervising the collection because it can be uncomfortable on both parts. So there are issues with staff training regarding the supervision of the collection. There can be issues with staff training on the keeping and maintaining the collection. There can be issues with staff training around proper storing and testing of the collection if the testing is taking place um, in-house. So 
some of the things that, that can be put in place for that is regular training at hiring, as well as ongoing training um, as part of regular staff meetings. The other thing we need to think about when we're thinking about collection, when we're looking at the issue of collecting and concern about how, when, and if our clients might be tampering, is the use of temperature monitored cups and the appropriate temperature that the specimen should be and making sure that in getting the the specimen that the staff is checking to make sure that the specimen is given to them in um, at the appropriate temperature. Oftentimes temperature monitored cups are used um, particularly with unsupervised supervision where the client or the patient is behind closed doors and so when they bring the uh, specimen out it's checked to make sure that the temperature is appropriate. The other thing to think about when we're looking at collection is whether or not at the time of collection are we using any uh, testing to check the specimen for adulterant. So I want to talk a little bit about the value and the difference between using in-house testing and laboratory testing or a combination thereof. Uh, Oftentimes, agencies will use the in-house testing uh, because it tends to be a little more cost effective in some ways, depending on who's, who's incurring what cost. So in-house, if the agency is paying for it, can be cost prohibitive. Uh, the issue then becomes the type of test kit and there are a variety of test kits out there, and we'll look at some of the test kits um, at the end of the session. But when we think about the type of test kit, we also need to consider what to test for. And one of the issues that impact cost is that the more we're testing for, the more the test kit costs. However, there are um, larger test kits where you're testing if you're testing for 10 things, using a 10, 10 drug test kit is more cost beneficial than using 10 single test kits. So we want to think about what to test for. And when we think about what to test for, we need to understand what our agency or organization's um, client population tends to be using. The other thing that we want to realize is that oftentimes our clients begin to know what we're testing for and if they're trying to continue to use and trying to be sneaky is they might choose to use not necessarily their drug of choice, but they might use some drugs that we don't usually test for. We find that most organizations test for marijuana, cocaine, opiates, and then they might add a few additional drugs to, to that basic screening. We want to be aware that oftentimes those clients that, that are not necessarily committed to their treatment and their recovery will often use substitute drugs that, that we're not testing for so that they can at least continue to get high. The other thing we want to think about with in-house testing is when to test. And we talked about that on a previous slide, but when we're thinking about in-house testing and when to test, that information can be very different for um, residential programs versus outpatient programs. And we want to think about when to test as far as the urine is con concerned. We know that the better, better sampling takes place first thing in the morning. Um, in outpatient programs where maybe a client is coming in for an afternoon IOP session or an evening IOP session, we obviously wouldn't be able to test in the morning. Um, when we're looking at residential programs, we want to think about in a residential program being able to, if we're doing random drug testing, to have the, the list of clients who are being tested that day and if possible test those clients first thing in the morning upon waking up. Uh, 
that also gives that opportunity for the client to, you know, if they if there's somebody who has a difficult time following the the testing procedure, whether it be supervised or unsupervised, is to be able to sit in our eyesight and consume water so that they can produce their sample. We also want to think about when to test with those ideas of being um, aware in a residential setting, if it's the type of setting where people do get off-ground permission or privileges, is the idea that regularly upon return from any off-ground activity that clients are tested. And that that be the expectation that they're tested when they're off-ground. We want to also think about in those um, outpatient settings, you know, making sure that the testing is random, making sure that we give a person time when they come in to be able to, to sit in front of us and uh, prepare themselves for the test. So we want to be aware of those things. When we're looking at in-house testing and we're thinking about staff training issues, we talked a little bit about the staff training issues that come with um, supervised or unsupervised. But when we're looking at using the testing kit, we need to be aware of the staff training issues around um, actually using the testing kit. And sometimes we find that it's, a, it's not one of those um, job parts that are like on the, oh, we need to train somebody on how to do this, because oftentimes it seems to be one of those things that is um, apparent or common sense, or it's one of those um, things that kind of gets trained on the fly or on the job. But whether or not somebody's drug test was accurate relies very, very highly on whether or not it was done appropriately. And particularly when we're looking at in-house where somebody might be testing, you know, five clients are being tested one right after the other, we want to make sure that people are aware of completing the test, getting the urine sample from the client, processing it through the test kit in whatever way that is appropriate for that test kit, securing the sample, and then moving on to the next client. So we have those issues that are, are can be very prevalent. We also want to be aware of the staff issues around processing somebody's urine. Um, particularly if we're using the testing kits that require use of the open container and a dropper and then dropping the urine into, um, into the test kit. So we want to be aware of people's feelings around urine, people's feelings around the whole process of testing, uh, and be able to deal with that in an effective way. We also want people to be trained in appropriately reading the test kit. Uh, most of the test kits indicate that even the faintest line shows that somebody has used, and staff needs to understand if there's a faint line, there's a line. The, the uh, darkness of the line does not have any indication on how much or how little somebody used. We need to be aware of, of that in both our training and our staff issues. Another issue that we have with in-house testing is client privacy. Um, this can particularly come up when we're, we're dealing with the supervision of urine. Um, it can come up with how the test is done, where the completed test kit is kept, how the information on whether the test was positive or ne negative is communicated to the client and to other people. The other thing that we want to be aware of with client privacy is if we're choosing to test because there um, has been suspect behavior or in a residential setting the client was out of the building or in an outpatient setting because of a number of missed appointment is to make sure that we're, we're maintaining the, the client privacy and that we're just testing, that, that the other clients do not know that we are suspecting something or that we have concerns about that particular client. I'm 
we'll move on to looking at issues related to lab testing. Some of the issues that come up when we're looking at lab testing is for um, urine collected in-house to go out to a lab or to send somebody out to a lab uh, to have their urine collected there. A doctor's prescription is part of that process. Additionally, um, with that doctor's prescription, the billing is frequently going to the client's um, personal medical insurance, medical assistance, their, their um, HMO, whatever, whatever that, that company might be. So we need to be aware of any limits that the, um, the medical insurance might have on the testing. Again, an issue with lab testing is the what to test for and the when to test, and those issues um, remain the same as they do with the in-house testing. Um, particularly when we're looking at um, if we're sending somebody in an outpatient setting to a lab, is being able to know that they're going to be able to get in and get tested on the day that we say this is when they need to be tested. Um, if we're doing in-house collection of the urine and sending the specimen out to the lab to be tested, we need to, um, again, be, be thinking about best testing is in the morning or when a first client first comes in. When we think about staff training for lab testing, if we're sending an in-house collection out to a lab, is making sure that the, the Staff is trained on the appropriate collection of the specimen in the cup, the appropriate storage, and how to get the specimen picked up. We also want to think about appropriate training for completing the paperwork. And every lab has a set of paperwork. Every lab's paperwork is different, uh, and what they some labs have some of the information that you need. They work with you and they have it pre-printed. And then the only information that we have to add is the identifying information of the client, the time and date of the specimen collection, um, and possibly what we are asking that it be tested for. However, one of the biggest issues that comes up with um, laboratory testing of collection, in-house collection, is that the form is not completed properly, the urine specimen is not stored and packaged properly, and then it gets to the lab and cannot be tested, whether it's because the form isn't completed properly and so they don't test it, or whether it's not properly labeled to match the form with the specimen and can't be tested, or whether the specimen leaks in travel, um, that, can, that can impact getting the result. Uh, one of the difficulties that we have in the difference between lab testing and in-house testing is in-house testing gives us an immediate result. And so if the test is positive or negative, we can provide the client with feedback. And um, if it's negative and our program is a drug-free program that has you discharged for a positive urine screen, we can have that happen immediately. Where with laboratory testing, we have the issue of collection to transportation to getting the results back. So that's one of those things that we want to think about as well with storage and pickup is that we don't want to, you know, do random drug testing on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and not have the specimens picked up till Thursday and then we don't get a result back till the following Monday. And then we've had clients in our program for a week saying that they're clean, having tested as um, positive, and then we have to, a week later, address um, the use. So those are some things that we want to think about, and we'll look at that when we talk about clinical intervention. 
this would be a good time to um, post any questions that you have about why we test, the collection of testing, in-house testing and lab testing, and we'll continue on through how the testing works. And when we get through how the testing works, we'll check on any of the questions that we may have had for the uh, why testing, the collection, and the in-house versus lab testing. OK, so moving on to um, testing and how it works. When we think about drug testing, um, there, are, are, there is the one test system and the two test system. And um, the one test system, system uses the immunoassay to detect the presence of drugs. Uh, and that's most often used for medical purposes and in our clinical and rehabilitation setting. The two-test system um, uses that same initial result and then um, a confirmatory test using different technology. And uh, one of the things that I think is important to think about is that the in-house testing is a one-test system. Most lab tests are also a one-test system unless we request on a positive for a confirmatory test to be done. What we need to understand is that that, confirm, that confirmatory test can run from 50, 50 to 150 dollars, and that confirmatory test is not often covered by medical insurance. I would like to encourage people to think about the importance, though, if we are going to discharge a client for a positive urine screen, the value of using the confirmatory test unless the client admits to the use. And we'll talk later when we look at the idea of clinical interventions and using urine drug testing as a tool on how we want to work with the client who tests positive. So when we, this, this is, I'm going to say this is the uh, science part of the training. And I am not a scientist, so I'm going to give you the information. Um, as, as I understand it, and I know that there are a lot of people out there that this is the place where you're going to tune out, or there's our medical people, and this is the place where you're going to tune in. But when we think about what is the immunoassay, it's a biochemical test. And what it does is it measures the concentration of the substance that we're testing for, and its reaction to an antibody, and it's the antigen to the drug. So we're looking at not necessarily measuring the drug in the system, but we're looking at the measurement of a reaction uh, of an antibody or antibodies to the drug. And these antibodies are a type of protein that's produced by the immune system in response to a foreign substance. And how it works is the antibodies bind to the antigen that's responsible for its production. And so we'll look at a little visual of this event. So when we look at it, the antibodies, which are usually harvested from sheep or rabbits, um, and they're re represented um, as the uh, Y here, the Y shape. Um, and they're developed against different classes of drugs. And so when we're looking at our testing kits, and as, as we get these designer drugs, we see that there are more and more individual drugs that, and classes that we're testing for. And so the shape recognition at the end, um, the antigen is, is recognized. And that's how, under the microscope, they identify the presence of the drug. The drugs are then the tag drug targets. Um, indicated by the tag is bound to the target 
drug, and the tag may be an enzyme, a fluoro fluorophore, or a particle, and then the detection is based on the binding. So when the antibodies bind with the drug in the sample or with the tag drug target, that's how we identify that positive drug screen. So if you look in, and this is this would be an example of the urine sample with the drug in it, and um, and the antibodies, and then it's set it's set there, and we can see that it's binding, and that would tell us that we are um, showing a positive drug result. When we look at the antibodies bind in the drug sample. Um, the tag targeted drug is added and there might be little or no antibody binding um, of the tag compound and so we see little or no change in the process. The sample without the drug in it, they add the antibodies and then it doesn't bind. And then with the drug in it we see those changes and this shows us that it is, in fact, binding and produces the changes in the signal. So when we think about this, we look at um, the immunoassays are used to screen the specimen for the presence of drug or a drug classification. And so when we think about some of the overall drug classifications, we would be looking at a THC presence, We'd be looking at opiates. The opiate test is separate from the methadone test, which is also, there's a separate test now for OxyContin. Um, so we have a variety of drugs that are, that, um, and classes that we can test for. The test may be conducted, you know, on site um, or in the laboratory. When we think about that on-site testing, we use what we call a point of collection test, and those are those devices that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, what we know about testing conducted in the laboratories have validated the procedure, and we know that both the in-house testing kits as well as the um, lab results are fairly accurate. Um, and one of the things to think about with the um, laboratory testing is that some labs test more than 10,000 specimens per day, and um, so we know that, that that can be very effective. Um, we see that tests um, measure for cross-reactivity so that we have um, a minimization of the number of false positives, and then the appropriate conclusions can be drawn regarding the um, presence of a drug in the system. And in, an immunoassay with low specificity will react with many antigens of similar substance. So an example with that is an, the amphetamine immunoassay with a cutoff level and these are the levels, and that's the, the, one of the things that can be helpful about lab testing is that they have identified cutoff levels. So when we look at amphetamine immunoassay with a cutoff level of um, 300 per milliliter, um, we can get po positive results with a number of things. So that would give us a pos positive res result with Phenamine with methamphetamine with ephedrine, and so that can um, create a positive result um, that would not necessarily prove the use of amphetamine because ephedrine is, is available in over-the-counter medication. So we want to be aware of that. There's also um, some issues that have come up with um, some other medications that interfere with the drug testing, and we will look at that a little bit later. So do we have, did we get any questions in regarding um, 
testing, collection, in-house laboratory? Um, I do have a couple questions here and, and a couple comments. Um, the first is uh, we've had a few samples test positive for benzos only to come back from the lab negative. What can we do to avoid this, if anything? And that's one of the reasons why we think it's very important to have a confirmatory test done when you have a positive, because there are possibilities of false positive. And we'll look at some, some later in the presentation, we'll look at some medications that can cause that false positive and how you can get some resources um, listing some of that information so that you can double check with any medications that, uh, that a client is prescribed that could be causing those um, positive results when there was not actual use. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are you going to cover quantitative analysis and what levels are usually used to confirm results? We are not going to cover that. Um, that's actually one of those things that if you're looking at um, using a laboratory is to discuss with the laboratory what levels they're testing at and what, you, um, what levels you want to be looking for. Okay. Um, what is proper supervision of urine collection? Proper supervision of urine collection can be um, that is really based on an individual agency's policy. And the urine collection policy should always be made clear to a client upon admission. Some agencies do what they call unsupervised, where the client goes into a closed restroom and um, then brings the urine out. Most agencies that use that method do use the cup that identifies the temperature to make sure that the temperature is at least correct as a, a step against um, adulterating the urine. When we look at supervise, what we call supervised urine collection, that literally means that the staff person and the client are in the same proximity with the, the staff being able to visually see the urine going into the cup. So we're talking about some pretty close proximity to make sure that the person isn't dipping the, the cup in the water or reaching um, with their hand and putting something else in the cup. Okay. Uh, here's a comment, and then I have one other question after that. Okay. Um, in the test that we use, the absence of a line is a positive test. The confirmation of a line means that the test is negative. However, you stated even a faint line can be determined to be a positive test. It, it, if, you're, if you're looking at a test where any line is a positive, then it doesn't matter how faint or how dark the test is. If you're looking at a test where no line is a positive, then you're looking for no line whatsoever. Okay. And uh, this last is a question. Do all labs use the same cutoffs? No. All labs do not use the same cutoffs. So it's important to um, know what cutoffs your labs are using on their initial as well as the confirmatory. Oh, let's see. Um, OK, uh, there's one more. Um, it's, uh, will you discuss standard versus ETG test for alcohol? No, we will not be talking about the testing for alcohol. OK, that's it for now. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you all for those wonderful questions. OK, when we're looking at tampering, and I believe that you know, when, we, uh, when we title a training, you can't fool the bladder police, we really look at that because we know that frequently um, our clients are trying to um, pass their drug screenings, their drug tests, um, and there are a variety of ways of them trying to do that. And what we want to do is educate ourselves to minimize that. Um, we are looking at the idea that on the internet, uh, 
our, our clients can go on the internet and find a variety of ways to um, try to pass their drug testing, try to tamper with the drug testing, and we want to be aware of what those are and how we can address those. So we're going to be looking at three ways um, of tampering. We're going to be looking at diluting, doping, and substitution. And when we look at diluting, that's exactly, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's how do we saturate the body fluids um, so that we can lower the um, amount of drug that is in the urine when it's tested. And so this is a list of um, things that are out there that our clients will try to use to um, dilute their urine. Um, some of it is very common, easy to get to things, um, niacin, vinegar, easy to get to, fiber pills, easy to get to, um, then there's a variety of things that they can go to um, the uh, herbal stores, herbal medicine stores, um, the health food places, or online to get things like ready clean pills, rapid cleanse. Um, something called detox tea, golden seal. Uh, golden seal has been one of those things that people have been trying to use for years, and the, the list continues. So one of the things that we want to understand with diluting is that there are uh, things out there that kind of help us see whether or not the uh, urine has the appropriate um, consistency, and we'll look in a few minutes at some of the things that we're looking at for that, um, that, that a lab and um, some in-house measures that we can use to check for diluted urine. When we look at doping, doping is the idea of adding something to the urine that uh, defeats the, the uh, binding in the test. And so some of the things that are added um, can be bleach, water, which is that almost the dipping in the, the toilet, ammonia, blood, um, Drano, golden seal, peroxide, um, any kind of liquid hand soap, some stuff that they can get um, in the uh, stores, the health food stores or on the internet, Mary Jane Super Clean, purify it. Um, you can add table salt, vinegar, visine, WD-40. These are all things that are used. Um, some things that can be effective, um, chlorinated bleach powder, um, when added, um, sometimes is not detectable by some of the, the sample, the kits that we have that can test for adulterated um, urine. Um, can does try to dilute the sample with water. Um, however, the problem with that is that it will tend to affect the temperature, um, and that can be, you know, that's one of our ways of, of going against this tampering. Um, ammonia, they can add it, and it would affect the ability to do the test. However, um, it will change the pH sample enough and um, frequently, the ammonia odor is strong enough to be identified um, just when you get the sample. The other thing that we're looking at when we're looking at tampering is substitution, which is ways in which they bring in a sample of urine that they know is clean. And again, this is one of those issues that we have with unsupervised uh, urine collection. And some, some clients can get it past the, the supervised urine co collection. And one of the things that we look at is a concealed container. Uh, and that can be, um, on a man, a container that might be taped or attached to the penis. On a woman, it can be a container that's inserted into the vagina. And um, 
is not necessarily easily detectable even with a supervised uh, urine. So very simply, when we're looking at a concealed container, um, they conceal the, the urine. Um, and then they put the, that urine into the container. One of the things that, that the client needs to be able to do is they actually oftentimes have to practice with this to make sure that they can um, get the container open in a way that's not visible to somebody who's watching. Um, so that is why some programs actually have a person change out of their clothes and into a gown before they go in to do the urine because once they're in that gown, it's um, harder for, for them to be able to like get past all of that. Women can um, put the, the urine in a condom. They can put it in a cigar container, a visine, an a, a eyedropper type of thing. Uh, and then a balloon, and then they can prick it with a nail, fingernail, or a pen. Again, this is why it's important that we're making sure that the sample uh, that we take is the appropriate temperature, because oftentimes these um, substituted samples will not be at the appropriate temperature. When we look at in injection, uh, this is not frequently used by by people in drug and alcohol treatment programs. This is more often used by um, athletes that are being tested under strict supervision. And they actually um, empty their bladders and um, inject directly into their bladder via a needle um, the urine that will test negative. Extreme is the catheterization, and then there's the containers and the droppers that women can use inserting and that men can use by actually taping to their penis. So we want to look at some countermeasures. The obvious countermeasure is color. And Color, it, you know, and that's one of those things. Anybody who has been the person collecting urine for a long period of time recognizes that the color of urine can be very different from a very light, light yellow, um, almost clear, to a very dark yellow. Um, urine can be impacted um, in color when a woman is menstruating, and the color can change as a result of um, a variety of health conditions as well. But anytime there's a color that seems off from what we would call the usual color, we might want to consider that suspect. Uh, probably one of the most important um, countermeasures to tampering is temperature. And again, um, if we're doing in-house collection, the easy solution to that is the um, the cups with the temperature control device right on it that identifies the temperature. The next thing we're looking at is um, what we call um, creatinine, which is um, found in the urine. And it should be at a specific level. And um, if the urine has been diluted with water or any of those adulterants, that will be off. One of the things we need to be aware of with that, too, is that level can be off just because somebody actually is a person who drinks the recommended um, six to eight eight ounce glasses of water per day. And if somebody drinks more than that, that level can be, be off as well. We also look at the pH level of the urine, and that is um, would be impacted by any of the adulterants that get added. And then the specific gravity can be tested in the lab, and that um, would look for adulterants as well. OK, I'd like to um, take this time for, let's say, a five-minute break and any questions to come in. And then when we come back from that break, we'll answer those questions. We'll go on to looking at. Um, false positives, false negatives, and um, 
detection time.
Hi, uh, thank you all for sticking with us. I hope you had a nice little break. This is Chris, and um, right, uh, I have a couple notes here that people didn't have any audio. That's just because we turned off the phones and the, um, the microphones uh, while we were on the break. So hopefully you'll all be back now and can hear us. Thank you. And Chris, do you have those questions for us? Uh, yes. Here's the, the few that came in during the break. Uh, go back up. Um, okay. Second. Okay. Uh, if blood is a means of doping a sample, does a female who would have had her period uh, provide an inactive sample? No. A woman who is on her period, that that um, sample is still um, valid. They try to use blood to dope the sample, however, it's not really effective. Okay. What is the correct temperature that should be displayed on a temperature sticker? Should be between 91 and 97 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Uh, can you talk more about how specific gravity works? That is not something that I can talk more about. However, the, the gravity testing, any time a specimen is sent to a lab, that is actually part of the laboratory testing. OK. Uh, should you request specific gravity be checked for every urine screen? Why or why not? That's, that's part of the laboratory process. OK. Uh, can you discuss a little more about the effect of excess water drinking as on urine screen? The, the issue with the excess water drinking is that it will affect the creatine level. And oftentimes, a lab will um, have that, that test that that level will be off, and they will say it's an invalid sample or a suspect sample. Okay, um, let's see here. I work with DWI. Can you discuss the term flushing, and is there any validity to this type of tampering? I, I'm not familiar with the term flushing. I'm assuming that that might be um, like a diluting or um, possibly a doping, but I'm not familiar with that term. Okay, maybe um, Mr. Uh, Kersey can um, type in more information for us. So, um, what is the normal creatine, creatine level in a urine? I'm uncertain of that actual number. Usually the lab will just report back that, that it was an inappropriate level. Okay. Okay. I think we're... we're back and have uh, completed all the questions right now. OK, we're going to move on and look at some um, drugs that might um, cause false positives, um, particularly in um, the in-house testing that we use, but also in laboratory testing. So we'll look at some of these medications. Um, Sestiva, which is an HIV antiviral, um, can test positive for um, cannabinoids. So we're looking at um, testing positive for THC. Um, Rohypnol, which we don't necessarily say is, you know, we're not look necessarily looking at it as um, we'll test positive as a, a benzo. Um, if we're looking at Lamictal, which is taken for epilepsy and sometimes for bipolar, it can test positive for PCP. Um, the VIX inhaler, which is that little tube thing that um, people can put in their nose and sniff to help clear their nasal passages, frequent use of that can cause a positive for methamphetamine. Dilantin um, can test positive for barbiturates. Novocaine, so if somebody's had dental procedures done, Novocaine can um, test positive for opiates. 
um, Zantac, ranitidine, um, can test positive for methamphetamine. This is a, a frequent one that comes up with um, patients and clients in drug and alcohol treatment is these two medications for um, mental health disorders, Zoloft, generic name sertraline, and Effexor or the Effexor XL, um, generic name Venlefaxine can also, um, that one, the Effexor can give a false positive for PCP and the benzodiazepine false positive can be given for Zoloft. So when we look at the idea that false positives can come from a variety of medications, uh, we need to make sure that we're aware of all the medications that our client is taking. Um, we want to be aware of any medical or dental procedures that they've recently had. And we want to um, make sure that we're taking this into consideration as we're looking at their um, urine drug test results. So when we think about this idea of a positive um, drug test, what we want to think about is that all positives require some type of clinical intervention on, on our part. Uh, that we don't have a client give a, participate in a urine drug test and then not give them feedback on the, the status of their drug test and what that, that means. So really, whether, the, whether a client's urine is positive or negative, we need to let the client know that, hey, yes, we did look at your drug test. And um, wonderful. I'm so excited to see that your drug test came back negative. So now you have, and you might, you know, be able to look and say, so that means you have, you know, 37 days clean. Is that correct? And, and so we want to use the drug testing as a clinical tool. So when we're thinking about false positives, we want to make sure that we review the client's uh, medication before engaging in the conversation with them. And that if the client is taking any medication that could fall cause a false positive, we really want to do a confirmatory test um, to, to ensure that. The other thing that we want to think about with that is, you know, the client and, you know, has the client been participating in treatment? If it's a residential setting, you know, has the client not been out of the building um, to access stuff? If we're in a um, an outpatient setting is, you know, what's the, the client's participation in group like? Because sometimes what we might want to, you know, be able to say is, you know, um, we had this, this uh, positive result for, let's say, benzodiazepines, and, and, and I know that you're on um, Zoloft, which could give a false positive. So at this point, you know, we're not real. You, you haven't shown any signs of relapse. You're actively participating. Um, you know, we're we're not um, going to perform a confirmatory test because again, remember that that confirmatory test can be very expensive. On the other hand, if if we're dealing with a client whose drug of choice might be benzodiazepines, then maybe what we want to be able to do is initiate a conversation with the prescribing doctor for the Zoloft to determine is that the medication that they should be on? Um, is there another medication they can take for their um, stabilization so that um, we could have a clearer test on um, whether or not they're using the benzodiazepine? Sometimes we have false negatives, meaning, you know, you know that the client used, whether you know because, you know, they came in and they said it, whether the talk in the, the community is that they used, whether you witnessed the behavior that sometimes we do have false negatives. And uh, that can come from time elapsed since use. So uh, 
when we have that, that particularly in those you know, residential settings and in outpatient settings, where the set staff suspected that the uh, client was under the influence and for whatever reason did not immediately procure a sample and waited, you know, something happened on Thursday, but nobody decided to get a sample until Monday. So the time elapsed and juice can ca cause a, what we would call a false negative. The client has, in fact, used drugs, but we have nothing that shows that they have. Um, it can be an improperly obtained or improperly secured specimen um, so that the, the specimen um, degrades in its, its quality or uh, the one that, that's always, you know, disheartening to me is that, you know, the specimen was taken and it sat in the refrigerator for two weeks before it was called to be picked up or the, the sample has been tampered with. So we have both issues of false positives and false negatives that we need to deal with. And we need to be aware that, you know, we have some internal policy around the um, drug screening process and that, uh, that maintaining and following that process to the T is, is of utmost importance um, to the staff and the management to make sure that um, we are maintaining that safe environment to make sure that we are able to address um, issues of use in a timely fashion. So we want to be aware of those things. So we want to take a look at some detection time and so that we kind of have an understanding of, you know, what our time frame is when we're looking at um, urine drug testing. So when we're looking at, the, at amphetamines, we're looking at an approximate detection time of two to four days. And the detection time can be impacted by things like the client's general overall health, their um, intake of fluids, um, their eating habits, and a variety of other things. When we're looking at barbiturates, um, we're looking at like a short-acting barbiturate, like a Barbitol is only one day, and what's considered long, long lasting, like a phenobarbital, um, that detection time can can be two to three weeks. We're also looking at detection times can be impacted by the frequency and the amounts as well. When we're looking at benzodiazepines, we're looking at a detection time of three to seven days. So we're looking at the idea that if somebody, you know, somebody uses on Thursday and we test them on Monday, we might be getting a um, negative urine result when they did, in fact, um, use. The cannabinoids, um, hash, marijuana, we're looking at approximate detection times of 3 to 30 days. Um, that's probably the drug that we have the most um, time on. Cocaine, we're looking at just two to four days. Um, codeine, we're looking at two to five days. Those euphorics, um, we're looking at one to three days. When we're looking at things like LSD and some of the other um, psychedelic kind of um, drugs, those um, acid type drugs, we're looking at one to four days. Methadone um, can show up in the system for three to five days. Um, we're looking, you know, that comes out of the system, you know, fairly consistently. Methoqualone, we're looking at 14 days. Generally, the opiates and PCP, we're looking at two to four days. Um, propoxyphene, which is um, like your Darvon, your Darvacet, six hours to two days, so that's a quick in and out. When we're looking at steroids, which um, a lot of drug and alcohol programs are not testing for, the oral steroids, 14 days um, if it's injected a month. So when we're looking at those detection times, we see that, you know, 
that really leads us to think about the when we test. Um, you know, we're testing, you know, on Monday. Um, there's, you know, a lot of the drugs we have an opportunity on a, a Monday test to get whether people are using over the weekend. But if in our program we like consistently test on Monday because we're thinking everybody's using over the weekend, um, you know, and then we, we lose the opportunity because now, okay, the clients are saying they test on Monday, so we're going to use Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So we want to be aware of, of the importance of like mixing that up so that they, they don't think that we're, you know, in this pattern. All right, now we're going to look at some ideas of clinical intervention. And this really goes to the idea of, um, you know, the, the, the title of the training, you know, you can't fool the bladder police. We've kind of looked at the ways in which our clients might try to, to, um, to fool us in this process. But the, the subtitle of this is effective use of urine drug screening. And in so many ways, I think that's the the really important aspect of drug testing is that we don't, you know, we don't want to, to think of drug testing as this punitive, aha, we caught you moment. We really want to be able to use that drug testing as the clinical intervention that it is. And so some of the things that we want to think about when we're looking at using drug testing as a clinical intervention is in, in staff training, really helping our staff to see that, that this is a tool that we use in helping our clients in their treatment and in their ongoing recovery. This is um, a tool in the same way that group is a tool, in the same way that individual therapy is a tool, in the same way that all of those you know, creative assignments that we give them is a tool to um, helping them learn to, to, to um, maintain their recovery, we want to really think about urine drug testing as a tool. So one of the important things to think about is upon admission into a treatment program, explain the role of drug testing in the treatment program. And explain it in, in that sense that, you know, we're not drug testing you to catch you. You know, we're drug testing you because it's a tool to help us. It's a tool to help you. That sometimes, you know, a client struggles to be honest with coming into to treatment in, you know, in an outpatient program and saying, oh, I, I messed up, I, I used last night. Uh, and when they get, get, quote, caught with that positive drug test, it, it kind of can be that clinical intervention. It can be that changing moment to help them with that process. We want to make sure that upon admission that we let them know how we do our drug testing. You know, do we do a scheduled drug, drug testing? Is it random or is it what we call suspicious? And I would hope that, that most programs are using all three of these, scheduled, random, and suspicious testing. And so when we think about what scheduled testing is, Scheduled testing might be something as simple as, you know, everybody whose last name is A through L gets tested on Monday. Everybody whose last name is M through Z gets tested on Wednesday. And then Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, we um, do some random testing. And that suspicious testing can happen any time that there's a suspicion. Uh, we want to make sure that if we're do using this as a, an effective intervention, that each time prior to securing the urine that we ask the client about changes in their medication and always ask the client if the client has used. Giving someone the opportunity to get honest before they get, quote, caught uh, is, is much more effective and helpful to their ongoing recovery than having to do the sit down after the positive result. Um, always look at this idea, and, and there's, you know, there's a couple different ideas on um, the, whether the client should know what drugs are being tested for and what drugs are not being tested for. 
But if we suddenly like start, you know, if, if all of a sudden, you know, you throw some new drug test in to the testing, is to kind of give like the why of this. And sometimes the why is simply, you know what, we mix up our testing because we know that, that um, people frequently, you know, stay away from their drug of choice when they're in treatment but move on to something else. So, um, so we kind of mix up and we use a variety of different um, tests. We always want to um, discuss the behaviors that brought about suspicion if we're doing a suspicious um, test. You know, if, if the client, if we're in an outpatient setting and um, the client has consistently come to IOP, you know, three days a week um, for the last six weeks, and now all of a the sudden their, their behavior, their attendance has gotten sporadic and they participate less in group and they're not making eye contact. We want to be able to say, you know, this, this behavior of yours has us a little concerned and so we're, we're going to, you know, do this drug test. Again, that gives the client the opportunity to either begin talking about whether or not they've used, or begin talking about other issues that might be affecting their ability to attend treatment, or what specifically that, that um, quote, suspicious behavior is about. And again, this, this helps to build a better clinical therapeutic relationship. I think it's always important if we're, we're telling clients that drug testing is a clinical intervention it's really important that we review the results with them upon our receipt of the results. Even if it's, you know, hey, Susie, we got your um, drug test back, and I'm really excited to see that you're negative again. You know, or if you're doing an in-house, the clients know that those in-house test kits are, are, you know, you can check those in just a, a matter of a few minutes. So. You know, if you just did that one client test and, you know, you did it in the morning and the client went on to group, is to make sure that after group you can say, you know, we, we got your test results and, and it's negative. And uh, the, each program has to determine whether it is the uh, person who did the um, actual collecting and testing that gives that information or whether it's a specific staff person or whether it's the client's individual clinician, but there should be some process by which um, after the, the, the test is, the information is received that the client gets that information. Again, with the negative, if the client comes back negative, again, we want this to be a tool. So we want to congratulate the client on being able to um, maintain their abstinence. Uh, it, sometimes it's worth reviewing with the client what drugs were tested for and uh, throw in, you know, so today we tested you for um, cocaine, opiates, and marijuana, and that was all negative. Have you been using anything else? Uh, sometimes being able to uh, build that relationship with the, the client allows the client um, to be able to um, be honest about what's going on in, in their, their recovery process. The other thing that we want to think about is asking the client about issues or problems when the sample was secured. One of the things that we want to remain sensitive to is how uncomfortable it can be for a client to give a um, urine sample, whether it's an unsupervised or a supervised, there's, there's some pressure involved in that. So being able to ask about any issues or problems can help us address any staff training needs, any sensitivity issues. So we want to make sure that we're, we're keeping that line of communication open. Okay. Looking at the clinical interventions when we're looking um, at the positive drug screen, we want to make sure that we uh, tell the client that we have the results. And before we say, oh, we have your results and they're positive, is say, you know, I have your, your, drug result, your drug test results here. Is there anything you want to share with me, anything you want to tell me before we review these? 
sometimes you know we you know it's that place where the client now knows they've been caught and rather than you having to do the aha the client you know kind of gives us tells us what happened and we can use this as a therapeutic intervention and finding out you know where what's happening what do we need to be do, doing different where where are the problems in your recovery process here um, review what drugs were tested for and, in, and indicate what was positive if the client isn't honest with us before we start reviewing and then allow the client time to respond. I mean, this is really an opportunity to build a therapeutic relationship. It's an opportunity to have um, a relapse be a, a, a turning point in somebody's process. So allow them the time to respond. So it, it you know, it can be one of those things where, well, you know, we tested for um, opiates and, and you came up positive and just leave the information out there, giving the client the opportunity to think about it, think about what this means to them, think about where they want to go from there. Um, ask the client, you know, if there's drugs that weren't tested but you suspect there might have been other drug use, is to ask them about any other drugs that they might have used at the time. You know, if you know that you have a client that, you know, tends to use drugs in conjunction and you tested for one and not the other, you want to you want to check and see um, what they were using, what happened. Um, when you're talking with the client and you're now they're now being open about using, you want to talk about, you know, when the client used, what were the circumstances, what happened, where do they want to go from here. Um, it's important too that that you review and discuss whatever the consequences are. And so that's, you know, that's individual to each program. Uh, many programs today no longer discharge immediately for relapse. So if yours is a program that does not immediately discharge for relapse, what are those other consequences? And those consequences should have been laid out from the beginning of, you know, the beginning of treatment. Clients should know what happens if they relapse. So being able to d discuss the program consequences as well as being able to discuss the client's natural consequences. Is the client court ordered? Is the client involved in the child welfare system? Um, is there um, family issues involved? So what, what happens for the client now that they've had this relapse? Uh, if we're looking at a discharge, if that's part of the process, um, being able to make the appropriate referral. If it's an outpatient program and the client isn't able to, to stay clean in the outpatient environment, do we need to make um, a referral for a higher level of care? If it's an inpatient program and you discharge because it creates an unsafe environment and the client wants to continue in treatment, is there another similar program where you can transfer them to? So we want to make sure that a referral is happening. If they're maintaining in, in your treatment program and you're not discharging them, then we need to look at what happened and help them to develop a relapse prevention plan so that this incident of relapse can actually, you know, be a turning point in their recovery journey and not an end. All right, we're going to look at some pictures. Um, of some a variety of testing kits and we're not promoting any kits these are just samples that I was able to get off the internet so that very first um, collection cup is just a general cup that um, has a place for the name and that information and that does not have a um, temperature strip the next cup shows a cup with a temperature strip and um, and it indicates, although you can't clearly see it on there, it indicates um, where the normal range should be. Um, the next kit is a test kit that is a dip kit so that you collect the urine in either the non-temperatured or the temperature, preferably the temperature if you're doing in-house kit, and you dip the sticks in there, you close it up, you wait the appropriate amount of time and then you read the kit. The nice thing about the kit like that is that it closes up so that if you want to make a photocopy of the results for your records, you have that. 
the um, next kit over um, shows is the kit where you actually have to use a dropper and drop it into the little wells. Now those two kits, the dip kit and the dropper kit, are kits that staff often have a difficult time with because it requires, you know, a little close proximity with the urine. Again, we always want to make sure that, that staff is trained in using, you know, putting gloves on before they, they get the urine, keeping the gloves on. The other thing we want to make sure of, though, is that, you know, they're also trained in appropriately taking the gloves off um, and making sure that when you have the gloves on after you touch the urine kit that you're not, like, touching the doorknob or answering the phone or using your gloved hand that may have touched the urine to press the buttons on the copy machine. The uh, kit in the lower left is um, a newer kit where everything is self-contained. Um, the person uh, urinates in that cup, gives it to the staff person. The staff person never has to touch anything that's touched the urine as long as the clients wipe the cup afterwards. There's a little key, little plastic key thing that uh, goes in or pulls out and allows the uh, kit to drop into the urine and then you read it as any other kit and again it has a flat end so that if you wanted to you can uh, lay it on your copier to make a copy and have results for your record. The last thing on the right is um, an adulterant testing kit and you drop that in, you put that in the urine and there's information on there to read regarding um, the pH and all of those levels that we, all of those things that we t talked about that look at um, dilution and um, tampering in any way. And so that is, that concludes all of our information. I want to put up a screen that has some resources that were used in creating this. Um, and probably one of the most valuable um, websites that you can look at is um, the NIDA website uh, for a variety of information. So at this point, I would like to open it to any um, questions that we have, and um, we'll have an opportunity to end a little bit early. OK. Back to questions. Um, it's a false positive only existent for Zoloft, or can other SSRIs produce this as well? The research that I did only indicated it for Zoloft. However, um, I would always check with the lab that you're using if it's going out, and the manufacturer of your test kit if it's in-house. And that would be one of the things that I recommend is that every company that, that manufactures any of those in-house um, testing kits, they have available, they don't generally send it out without you asking, but they do have available a, um, generally it's a fairly thick booklet that shows um, any of the, the uh, medications or things that could give a false positive on their particular test. Okay. Um, is there anything, like any kind of medications, that could cause a false positive for cocaine? Cocaine is one of those very interesting um, tests because cocaine, the uh, test for cocaine does not actually test for the presence of cocaine, but it tests for a metabolite that the body produces when cocaine has been ingested. So to my knowledge, there is nothing that creates a false positive for cocaine. However, um, at a previous training, I had a participant state that he had heard or read somewhere about amoxicillin doing such, but I was not able to find any of that information. Uh, this next um, question might have been listed on your, on your resources. Um, can you cite the source for information that Novocaine can lead to false positives for opiates? Um, I don't know that I can 
cite who gave me where I got that, but um, it would have been on one of the sites that's listed as the resource. Okay, that's good. And I mentioned to this person that if we couldn't get that, that we could always email her with that information later. Okay. And I would send that to all the uh, attendees, that information. Um, okay, or do we have any other questions? Yep, there's a few more. A confirmatory test will then rule out a positive, false positive, due to a medication they're on, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, urine not collected in a timely manner can lead to false positives? No, urine not collected collected in a timely manner will lead to false negatives. In other words, if somebody used on Friday and we're not collecting the urine until the following Friday, if, if the time frame has passed where that substance would be in the system. Okay. Uh, can marijuana take longer than 30 days to leave a client's system? Generally, they say 3 to 30 days. Um, Again, depending on a lot of things around like the client size, weight, general health, um, it can stay in the system a little longer. Um, THC attaches to, to fatty cells, so that can impact how long the marijuana stays in the system. But for the most part, as far as urine goes, they say 3 to 30 days. Okay. I do have a request here that you go back to the resources slide and leave that up. Okay. There we um, go. And also, we'll just take this opportunity to say that these PowerPoints will be sent out after the webinar. I'll send it to, out to all the attendees, along with the short evaluation form and um, some other information, so they can get that then as well. Excellent. OK. Uh, let's see. Of the things people can ingest to tamper with their urine, which are the most effective? That they that they, can you repeat the question, Chris? Sure. Of the things people can can ingest to tamper with their urine, which are the most effective? Well, when, when it comes to ingesting things, um, we're looking at some of those things that, that you know, under diluting. Um, most, most of what we find happening with that diluting of the urine is, um, that it it impacts the urine in some other ways where if we're using in-house testing that's why we want we really encourage people to use those strips that test for the adult adulterants because that will show the changes in the pH and those other things um, but we do see things like the the some of the stuff that they can get on the internet like the ready clean and and some of those things will uh, will tamper with the urine enough that if you're just using the in-house testing and not testing for the adulterants may affect the, the uh, validity of the test. Okay. If you're using urine screening as a tool, what is the role of comparing changes on quantitative analysis as a measure of current or past use? So we're looking at, at looking at the idea that um, you tested at this level on this day and this level, so it's coming out of, out of the system is, is how I'm interpreting that question. Um, again, you know, when we're looking at, at um, frequency of use um, and, you know, if we're looking at a drug-free type of program, we're looking at the idea of we're looking for not using. If we're, you know, accepting, like, some harm reduction or some change in use, we really want to be able to, to um, talk with clients about, okay, so when you started you were using every day and now we see that, you know, based on your numbers that you're probably only using once a week. So we're looking at, uh, you know, attaining their treatment plan goals. Uh, do these all in one kit have the ability to check adulterants too? Um, I have not seen a kit that has, like, the test strip for the adulterants along with the um, drug testing. I've not seen any kits like that. Okay. Somebody who markets that might do very well. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, one of 
the things people can ingest to tamper with their, oh, I already read that one. Uh, does Ultram come up as positive for benzos? Ultram, um, otherwise known as tramadol, um, can come up. I've, I've not seen anything saying positive for um, benzos. Um, I have read information of it coming up positive for, um, what is it, propoxyphene or methadone. Okay. Uh, I think this is the last one, unless somebody else popped up with some. Oh, uh, yeah, I've got some others. Okay. Um, let's see. You mentioned seeing urine sitting in a refrigerator for two weeks before being picked up. Will the test result be weakened if it is sitting there too long? And if so, what is the longest urine can sit before results are not altered? Generally, what happens is if it's set too long, what will happen if it's going out to the lab is the lab will come back and, and say that it's deteriorated and they can't perform the test. Okay. Okay. And um, are there tests for LSD? Are there tests for LSD? Um, I have. No, I, I can say that I personally have never seen any of the in-house tests that have LSD listed as um, as one of the possibilities. I always encourage. Um, people who are using in-house testing to um, talk with their representative from the company that they work with about what drugs their clients are using and what they want to be testing for. And oftentimes, the um, company that makes the, the testing can actually individualize testing kits to meet your needs. Hmm. So you need to work with them on what, they ha what testing they have available. Uh, this next one says, I was at a previous training where the toxicologist said that a patient who was diabetic, whose urine sat around, actually fermented and provided a false positive for alcohol. Wow. That's very interesting information, and, and I would trust the toxicologist on that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Is there a urine test for K2 yet? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, how do you di differentiate between heroin use and RX, oxycontin, or oxycodone? There's, some of the test kits actually have an opiate and an oxycodone test. So they're testing for different, um, you know, when we look at that immunoassay and, and what it's testing for, they actually test for different things. Uh, somebody says that they're aware of a test for K2 and bath salt. Excellent. Okay. Uh, if the urine creatinine, creatinine level reads 20 or under, is that the only time a urine should be considered diluted? Um, that's number one. Two is a creatinine level of 28 considered negative for all substances, and therefore we should not monitor the client's urine more closely. I do not have available with me right now all of the specifics on, on those levels, but I can um, get back to the people on that if they want that information. Okay. And the same thing, we'll just send that to all the uh, attendees so that they have that. Okay. Uh, it says there is a K2 test available through MedTox, that's M-E-D-T-O-X, in Minnesota. I don't know if it's available elsewhere, but I know we use it where I work. Okay. And it looks like this one last one just came in. Uh, regarding that each test, excuse me, regarding that each lab test will indicate the cutoff in a uh, reference range. I'm not real sure where that, um, what that relates to. It's just a statement. Uh, can a lab lower the cutoff levels of any substance and still have proper results? 
there's a standard level that all labs use, and then some labs will test for a lesser amount. So that's where you want to look at, you know, what the specific, what the lab that you're using is testing. Okay. And, uh, oh, here's one more. Um, okay, no, that's it. I think we've got them all. All right. Well, we want to thank all of the participants for um, joining us today, and we look forward to you joining us for future webinars. Thank you. Okay, and at this time, we will stop the recording, and you will be able to get this uh, on our website within the next few days, and I will um, be able to give you that information in an